Hello and welcome to Moderate Fantasy Violence, a podcast about pop culture and the world around it. I'm Alistair. And I'm Nick. And in today's episode, we will be reviewing Aaron Sorkin's new film, The Trial of the Chicago 7, and then the first series of Lovecraft Country. However, before we get into that, Nick, do you have anything to recommend to our listeners? Uh, yeah, this fortnight I read a new graphic novel from Image. There's a lot of interesting sort of self-contained graphic novels out at the moment, actually. But yeah, I read Dracula Motherfucker by Alex DeCampi and Erica Henderson, which is a new pulp horror graphic novel in which Dracula and the brides of Dracula resurface in Hollywood in the 70s noir era and start trying to recruit young starlets to join the brides and a young photographer finds himself embroiled with them and gets involved in this weird, lurid, grim nightmare. It's fun. It came out... A couple of weeks ago, and yeah, it's got an interesting sort of take on Dracula as this sort of basically focusing on his relationship with the brides as his sort of abusive boyfriend role. And yeah, the story's fun, but yeah, the visuals are like, for me, the big massive selling point. They're by Erica Henderson, who was previously best known for drawing The Unbeatable Squirrel Girl, which was a very good comic from Marvel. It was sort of silly, light-hearted, wholesome, yet intelligent take on Squirrel Girl, which ran for a few years and was very good but yeah she's now done this sort of Dracula comic which looks absolutely gorgeous she's got this sort of lurid red orange yellow neon colouring going on and this yeah every page of painting it's it's beautiful work I, I genuinely think there's awards in this somewhere for Henderson and the book as a whole is just a lot of fun to read so yeah Dracula motherfucker I mean that's one hell of a title <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, funnily enough, the middle two letters of fuck are starred out on the front page. I'm still impressed that they went there. I was actually wondering how they did that. So there's there's got to be rules about that. We haven't got to the point in civilization where you can print motherfucker on a book and have it displayed in regular shops. No, there's a a bloodstain sort of conveniently splattered over the middle two letters of fuck. Yeah, it sounds interesting. So is this is more a horror type thing or is it playing off? Because it also sounds kind of like a sort of pulpy 70s Hollywood story or it can be both, I suppose. It's kind of both. I think it's possibly more more the pulp story. And, well, it sort of starts the pulp story and then sort of bleeds into the horror. As I say, their version of Dracula, which in a weird way I don't want to spoil because it's quite a fun sort of take. Like, I think I, I listened to a podcast interview with Galax de Campi and she said her big thing was not wanting to make Dracula handsome. Like, you know, she feels like it's been done enough. The most horrible man in the world is also incredibly charming and suave. So in this case, the most horrible man in the world just looks absolutely repulsive. And yeah, they've certainly got a take on that visually. As I say, it's all part of Erica Henderson's art, which is extremely good. Yeah, that sounds, that does sound excellent. So yeah, that came out from Image a couple of weeks ago. I, and they seem to have been doing a few of these sort of graphic novels recently. There's been a series called November by Matt Fraction and Elsa Chartier which is also pretty good I'm not sure if Dracula motherfucker I just enjoy saying it is meant to be part of the a series or if it's just a one off well I think vaguely it's sort of we've done it we could do more if we want to but it's a self-contained story so yeah I don't know if there's going to be more from the same creative team and if it'll have any relation to this but yeah I really enjoyed this it's a, a quick fun read and you can sort of drag it out a bit but just marvelling at how good the art is I mean Dracula is such an iconic character he's one of those characters who's been done every sort of which way there's been like silly ones I mean like, there's even been like cartoon like Duck Dracula there's been like I've seen films where people trying to do like and are trying to find some historical accuracy in it you know there's the Francis Ford Coppola adaptation of Bram Stoker's books there's like a Doctor Who version so because like Dracula is kind of like up there with like Sherlock Holmes as character that you can imagine any way you like so as a writer it's a challenge I guess to find at least a somewhat original take or something that just doesn't seem really tired but it sounds like they've achieved that which is no mean feat yeah it's I mean I'm not a a student of the the Draculian arts at all but yeah it definitely isn't visibly like a, a clear take off of any of the classic versions of Dracula which you know even I have seen quite a few of I never watched a Stephen Moffat one at the start of the year because by the time I had any free time to watch it, everyone seemed to have aggressively turned on it. But yeah, there's a lot of takes out. I watched that first episode of that and it was bad. It was just on the side of passable, like one of the bad episodes of Sherlock, the ones that didn't want to make you throw your shoe at the TV. But um, everyone said like, oh yeah, that's the best. And it really goes downhill after that. And I was like, well, if that's the high water mark, I'm not finishing this. Yeah, a few people said that the first two episodes were good, but unfortunately it just aggressively went sour in the last one. And I don't know, maybe one day when I'm bedridden or something. But yeah, I, can't, I couldn't be bothered with three hour and a half episodes of that at a time. So anyway, yes, Dracula, motherfucker. <laughs>
That's, it's good. Out now. Check it out. I haven't heard as much buzz about this as I feel it deserves. So yeah, if you like comics and you're interested in anything I've said, then yeah, Vacuum Motherfucker is good. That does sound really interesting. I do enjoy a, a good bit of graphic art. Yeah, yeah. As, as I say, especially if you buy comics for the art, there's some amazing work here. I've, as I say, I've actually read a fair bit of Henderson's Squirrel Girl, and she's she's really you know evolved and moved her style along. And I think she's coloured it herself. I could see like a separate colorist credit, and it's really brought something different to it compared to her Marvel Comics work. Anyway, Alistair, what have you consumed in the last fortnight? Well, from from one iconic character to another, I've watched a film that's very recent, which is the surprise sequel to Borat, yeah. um, which is called Borat Subsequent Movie Film. So yeah, that uh, was released yesterday. So these are some very hot opinions as I watched the film last night. Yeah, it's got the same cringe humour as the first film, you know, with the funniest parts being the bits with unsuspecting members of the public being brought into Borat's many hijinks in America. So such as everything from kind of QAnon conspiracists, Trump supporters, various Republican groups that get gate crashed, an anti sort of abortion clinic, all gets kind of just dragged in. And then it is very funny in the sort of, oh, I don't know if I want to hide behind the pillow because I just can't look at how cringy this is, but also it's really, really hilarious. A lot of the film, which is quite interesting, is focused on a new character they've introduced, which is his daughter, played by Maria Bakalova, who's a uh, unknown actress, which is, I think, partly to get around the fact that Sasha Baron Cohen is too well known to do too much of the ambushing the public stuff as he is quite recognisable one of the sort of conceits they come up for this film is that because the last film was such a success Borat is now very well known so Borat has to go and disguise in America to prevent being recognised which is just gives him an excuse to dress Sasha Baron Cohen up in very elaborate costumes and stuff and, you know fat suits and fake beards and things like that so that he can kind of do the pranking on people without people recognising what's going on but also yeah a lot of it is led by the character of the daughter daughter who is relatively new she's a bulgarian actress i don't think she's done much in the english-speaking world and she's really really good actually she's probably one of the funniest things about the film and obviously like has some of the best of the ambush joke bits because of uh, you know her unknown status means she can pass for a kazakhstani tv journalist and do the kind of really awkward interview thing that they've done before yeah it is funny and it all kind of builds up to this surprise ending which they kept out of the trailer and which weirdly has since the film dropped yesterday has become international news so I'd recommend seeing it if you haven't read the news and find out the bit on the end because it is very funny and quite shocking. And I'm dancing around it because if you've not seen it, it's worth coming at it unspoiled because I was surprised that they were able to actually pull off like a large scale secret prank considering how famous Sasha Baron Cohen is and how everyone must be wise to his antics at this point. But no, they, they managed to do it, which is quite impressive. Yeah, this is, I guess I probably shouldn't spoil it on the podcast now, but I'm assuming it's the thing involving a major American political figure that I've seen mentioned of in the news. Yeah, that's, that's oh, okay. it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's it, that's it, yeah. Yeah, it's just surprised they managed to get away with it. Again, it does largely hinge on that segment is led by Maria Bakalova, who I guess is obviously not well known. Well, yeah, I was, the main part I was interested in is, okay, I guess I, I haven't actually seen the prank, so I have no idea to what extent the issue is that that guy just doesn't know who Borat is or if they just kept Borat away from him. But it sounds baffling. I do probably need to watch this at some point just so I can, you know, be in on the general joke. I mean, and it is as funny as the first one. I... I guess it doesn't have the, the kind of freshness of the first one. I mean, it's not like that Borat invented pranking members of the public you know, with ridiculous characters or pranking politicians or media figures. I mean, Sasha Baron Cohen was doing it before on Channel 4 with the shows where he created like Borat and Ali G and Bruno and things like that. But I guess Borat, the original film, took it to like, another level. And I think part of the humour is because of the way Borat acts with his like rampant misogyny, anti-Semitism, you know, all sorts of things. But kind of, I feel very much the joke is that it's the way that people behave when they're given kind of permission to act the way we wouldn't normally by Borat. I guess what's funny and interesting in the film is that the first film and this film as well is that when Borat says something misogynistic or anti-Semitic, the fact that few people tell him off and um, more people actually almost kind of seem to relax and be like, oh, we can speak freely around this person because he doesn't have these Western values. And then it reveals kind of the way people actually are, but they're just pretending not to. Yeah, it does obviously sound like sending Bob out to meet the terrifying people of QAnon is probably going to end up ending strangely. I mean, I like I genuinely have no idea how famous Bob Ass and Sasha Baron Cohen are outside the UK. As he first rose to Providence in Britain, I often end up assuming he's kind of a British thing. But I guess at this point, most Americans who have 
seen some films probably know who he is yeah borat and bruno and stuff also was served well by internet age where like you know funny bits can easily be clipped and shared on youtube and social media and stuff and kind of go viral and things like that i mean it's probably even like deliberately designed so to be kind of well marketed in you know in that way but yeah i, I mean i keep thinking surely there comes a point when sasha Baron cohen's fame prevents him from doing things like that i mean he's been doing a lot more straight up acting rather than pranks recently he did a whole series of them of prank stuff like last year didn't he uh, this is America or who is America or whatever it is. Yeah, he did a show that I watched some of, yeah, last year, creating some new characters involving, like, wearing a lot of makeup and things like that. Yeah, I'm just impressed that he can still keep doing it because he, he is very good at it. And, you know, after a while, I can see how he might want to do something different, uh, you know, move on from this style of comedy. I just said in this podcast, a few months ago, I watched Sasha Baron Cohen doing a dramatic part in The Spy, in which is no comedy at all, pretty much. It's a quite a grim, tense spy drama. And I'm sure we'll be discussing Sasha Baron Cohen in trial of the chicago seven soon so he has range and he's clearly exploring doing other things right now but is still keeping at least one foot in the ambush comedy that he's so good at yeah as you say it's easy to assume that his move into doing a lot more dramatic acting is because he's finally decided he's exhausted the ambush comedy or reached a point of oh god i'm too old for this but (laughs) it's Nice that he still has a, a desire to keep doing it, I suppose. Yeah. Nice unless you're one of the people he's ambushing. Yeah, there is that. Well, yeah, I, I think the fact that this film does rely so heavily on Maria Bakalova taking on so much of the kind of ambush comedy kind of shows that his fame maybe has reached a point where it's difficult to do. I suppose it's the fact that Borat as a character is so well known, whereas with Who is America, he created new characters. And obviously the times when the ambush comedy just didn't work out because the victim just stopped and went, hang on, you're that Sasha Baron Cohen bloke. Probably don't get broadcast. Yeah, there is, there is that. There is that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I don't know to what extent he's, you know, game to the point that he would broadcast even his failed attempts. But I'm guessing not that many times. I guess yeah, they're probably kept secret somewhere. Yeah, but at the disaster years, his lawyer has it, and it'll be released to Netflix shortly after Stasha Baron Cohen's death. Yeah, can't wait to cover it. <laughs> Okay, and first up, it's your regular moderate fantasy violence coverage of the latest Aaron Sorkin release. Although, to be fair, this one does seem to have got a bit more attention from the general public as well. This is, of course, The Trial of the Chicago 7, the new film written and directed by Sorkin, out now on Netflix, covering the historical trial of the, well, of the protesters charged with inciting riots at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago in 1968. And this film stars, as you may guess from the title... A whole fucking load of people, including but not limited to Yaha Abdul Martin II, Sasha Baron Cohen, Daniel Flaherty, Joseph Gordon Levitt, Michael Keaton, Frank Langella, John Carroll Lynch, Eddie Redmayne, Mark Rylance, Alex Sharp, and Jeremy Strong, and more. Lots of people who are very famous, and lots more people from the I'm sure I've seen you in something section of American Actors. Yeah, it's a courtroom drama. It's about the ongoing heightened corruption and baffling levels of government interference in the trial of these protesters who are clearly being made an example of. And obviously, you know, this film about protesters being aggressively and very corruptly, corruptly, probably not a word, dealt with, has a certain timely relevance. So yeah, we've seen it. Alistair, what did you think? So this is an example of some great Aaron Sorkin's writing and, and directing as well. Sorkins is the modern master of the courtroom drama. He starts out by writing both the play and then the film version of A Few Good Men. You know, his kind of snappy dialogue obviously really brings to life a film that's in the setting of basically a lot of people talking and hammering out like what happened and different points of view and different ideas. It's, he's the sort of the ideal writer for making that kind of process interesting. So much of what he writes is about you know people sitting around in rooms debating things, which is the essence of this film. It's not quite a I don't know, like typically Sorkin as a lot of his other writing. Obviously, there's, you know, it's got a lot of the kind of flair that his writing normally has, but the characters don't speak quite in the sort of sharp back and forths in the way that West Wing characters did as, for example, the characters in the social network, even though they're all real people, they kind of did speak very much like they just walked off the set of the West Wing. Whereas this, there's less of the kind of signature stalking style, more of a, a veer towards the way people more naturally speak, but still with that at a kind of intense precision in the writing. It's a powerful film, you know, it's got a strong message, there's a lot of emotion to it. At the end, or certain points, I uh, had a tear in my eye. At some some bits I think it kind of veered into the corny territory we can come to that but overall I thought this was yeah strong innings from Sorkins for his second 
directorial film. Yeah, I'm always slightly wary of my own view on the Aaron Sorkin range of products because I'm aware that West Wing got to me as an early age and I have this sort of Pavlovian happiness response to just hearing his dialogue tone. Like, I enjoyed the experience of watching a large chunk of the newsroom, even though I'm also aware a lot of it was quite bad. But yeah, I really enjoyed this, surprising no one. And my partner, who claims to have seen little to no Sorkin before, she's not even seen The Social Network, also really liked it. So hopefully I'm not completely deluded. Yeah, this was nicely paced reconstruction. It takes you through it well. It's got a very light touch of keeping all the cast. And as I implied heavily during my intro, this is a very large cast. Involved, there are a few outside characters, sort of out of the main circle characters, who as a result have arcs which are a bit simple or half-formed. Like the Joseph Gordon-Levitt character, who I gather was a bit more of a straightforward dick in real life, but anyway, is given this sort of very small arc which basically boils down to Yes, he's one of the baddies, but he's not all bad. And it's one of the things Sorkin likes to do. I think his view is that as part of writing, it's his job to make sure that all the villains are just simplistically evil. And there are, you know, plenty of simplistically bad people here. The judge in particular has shown no historical mercy in this film. So yeah, I guess in comparison to people like the judge and some of the other lurking government spooks, he wanted to have someone who wasn't just cartoonishly happy to punish the defendants in an attempt to make it seem realistic to the viewer. And in a way, especially as somebody who's seen a lot of Sorkin, it's quite transparent but it does work it does get a light tone and as you say it's I think it resists the urge to go too much into long sequences of Sorkin snappy back and forth I think partly because he's got this very I don't know if it's austere the right tone this, this sort of I'm writing historical drama these are important events I don't want it to seem too artificial or constructed like full on Sorkinese like the full on toad of snap 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 patter 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 pitter patter pitter patter which he writes in things like West Wing and the Newsroom is not how people talk and I think even he must be aware that it's not how people talk it might occasionally be how a couple of people who know each other really well talk to each other but it's not how the average group of people talk to each other in their workplace and to get you to you know, fully immerse in and take this seriously as a historical event I think he's recognised the need to at least slightly pull back on that a little, which I think is to the benefit of the film. I mean, a few people get to, like, snap out their Sorkinisms a bit more. Like, the main character... Well, I don't know. Is there a main character? One of the major characters, Abby Hoffman, played by Sasha Baron Cohen, gets to deliver quite a lot of wry, snappy, sorkiny one-liners. But yeah, it's not quite as widely dispensed as it can be. Possibly as a result of restraining some of his ticks, at least a little, this does end up being one of his better films. And you know, we always say this, I'm pretty sure we came to Body's Game and said, his best film since The Social Network. And now we're on the verge of probably saying that about this as well. Yes, we like Aaron Sorkin films, we do. But this does seem to have had a good reception outside the normal circle of people who like Sorkin films. No, I agree with that. I think you're spot on when you say that he's toned down his style to a sense of historical accuracy. And also, I guess, similar to what he's done in the past, obviously he's a very political writer. No surprise from someone who wrote a show about the White House and people doing politics, and not in a way that they held back on his political views. Everything from the newsroom to, to Molly's game has feeds in some politics to it in some way. And this is him kind of really bringing in a lot of contemporary politics as well, as as you said in your opening, there's a lot of Black Panther stuff um, is brought in, which obviously trying to explore the kind of racial politics of the time it has many parallels for today. You know, this open racism in the criminal justice system, especially as you mentioned from the, the judge, who is the most contemptuous of one of the defendants, the only black one, Bobby Seal, who was the leader of the Black Panther Party at the time, how he's treated with incredible racism by the criminal justice system. He's bound and gagged at one point in court. Obviously, that has a lot of relevance today when we're thinking about open racism in the criminal justice system um, and how you know black people are properly represented Bobby Seale's character is denied a lawyer you know again plays on ideas of black people not being given adequate representation in the legal system so yeah there's he's really bringing the politics in and I mean for a film that's about people on you know it says it several times in a political trial it manages to weave in the politics into the drama so you get character politics dialogue all kind of working together I'm not going to say this isn't a film that lectures you about politics it clearly is because it's a courtroom it's the closest you're going to get unless Aaron Sorgers makes a film about an actual political lecturer it's hard to find a way that you could create a film that lectures more about politics but it's not it doesn't detract from the film it's kind of part of its appeal because it's all weaved together so well um, um, and again, bringing in these contemporary elements as well, the police treatment of protesters, how far is civil disobedience kind of tolerated by a civil society? You know, all those contemporary issues are fed very much into this film. Well, yeah, and Alan Sorkin is sometimes accused, I think, of being, well, as you said, kind of corny, kind of, mm. I don't know, I guess, kind of centrist, kind of aware of social justice issues, but very much of an opinion that the, the way to deal with them is to, you know, go through the system. Yeah. Yeah, and although, you know, I, I don't think he's entirely got away from that. There's a level of 
cynicism about the system and willingness to admit that some parts of the system are sometimes just corrupt, which is unusual from his work in this one. And I, I don't think he, you know, hits it that hard. I think he has one of the characters, again, I think it's the Baron Cohen character play to say towards the end that he thinks the problem is not the system, it's the people who run the system. But there's still a level of cynicism in this film which is surprising from him sometimes. Although he does still go for the, the corny, big, emotional ending because he's having talking. Yeah. No, absolutely. And he has made like, yeah, the West Wing is very much like, wouldn't politics be better if the right, smart, clever, well-meaning people were in charge of it? You know, sort of show. Whereas this... I guess, does express some cynicism about the system, but it is about people on some level working from the inside to change it, such as the like the Eddie Redmayne character. I will say that this is, it's a very liberal view of America and liberal as in, you know, Clinton, Biden, what passes for center left in america view of you know of the fact that like if we just make the right arguments to the right people we can convince the um knuckle dragging thugs that racism is wrong or you know we can convince people that of the rightness of our cause and even to the point of it's kind of really not only expressing their view but kind of patting itself on the back for having this view this kind of like being quite self-important about making a passionate speech will win over people and Although there, maybe there was a time back when, I don't know, Obama was in the White House or something like that, and, you know, and the West Wing had only recently just finished, but people might have believed that a bit more. But in the modern world of disinformation and screaming indignant partisanship, I don't know if I, for one, believe any more that a well-passioned, well-reasoned argument can win the day. No, I mean, a lot of Sorkin's political work, well, the West Wing, basically, was written during, what, the late Clinton into George W. Bush era. Yeah. And perhaps you could argue that he was, there was probably was a bit more by bipartisanship around that time. American bipartisanship seemed to properly die off around the time Obama came to power and for some unknown reason Republicans suddenly became very unwilling to work with Democrats. This is a complete outsider's half-informed view of American politics and it's been a long time since that happened you know we're a good 12 years into that cycle now. One can see why some of Sorkin's political works might sometimes seems a bit out of date and yeah I think there's maybe there's the beginning of a willingness to engage with that here during the bits where the police just start beating up the demonstrators it's not as if any of them anyone manages to change their mind with a speech. I mean maybe we had the good luck that Aaron Sorkin was you know his hands were somewhat tied by the fact that he's writing a historical film and that is what happened you know. Yeah. Maybe if this had been a fictional film by Aaron Sorkin, the Abby Hoffman character would have given a passionate speech that persuaded the police to leave. But happily, we'll never know. Yeah, I think the Sorkin's views of politics is more expressed through the Eddie Redmayne, Tom Hayden character. I think Tom Hayden himself went on to marry Jane Fonda, which is a uh, just a bizarre uh, <laughs> footnote for history that didn't make it into the film. I wanted to share, but the Eddie Redmayne character, who's very well cast in the role and plays it really well, of this man who's deferential to authority but has you know strong views and is willing to work within the system to achieve what he wants, and doesn't like the rabble rousing Abby Hoffman character and his approach of being unpresentable and rude and disruptive. You know, kind of the tension between them is kind of the core of the film, which is the core of the film's political arguments between the person who passionately wants to file the right paperwork and the person who kind of wants to just i don't know storm the balustrades of power i suppose is one way of looking at it it's interesting though the film obviously has political conflict between those characters but also then they're both white so it has the black panther element as well the kind of racial politics brought in as almost like a third faction the film is very much about the divisions on the the american left between those kind of three groups I mean, there's other things like there's the John Carroll Lynch playing David Dellinger, who's like kind of from the sort of pacifist Quaker tradition of politics. And, you know, it's, it is quite a lot of complexity brought in and a lot of history brought into the film. But it is very much about that the argument, especially which you see now on the left between, I guess, the Sorkinese Tom Hayden kind of passionate speeches, you know, and appeals to decency can win the day versus the kind of Abby Hoffman. We need to be in the streets and causing a ruckus approach to politics. Well, yeah, I mean, but I guess, although, yes, Hayden's approach is more associated with Sorkin but I don't think he writes Hoffman as wrong no he doesn't which is one of the things about the film is that unlike previous Sorkin things it's not trying to really push one side of liberalism it's trying to explore the differences between the groups and their different approaches and where each other might be right and wrong where they agree where they disagree there's much more dialogue literally dialogue between factions going on in this film I mean I remember in the newsroom there's a bit when they have someone from Occupy Wall Street on and the main character the host basically says like to the woman from Occupy Wall Street like what economic system would you replace capitalism with and she doesn't like have like a coherent answer to that and i really felt this basically like Sorkin basically saying yeah i'm not on the side of these anarchists 
you know, mask wearing people in the streets chanting and shouting about changing the world because they don't have a plan and they don't know what they're doing. They're just kids doing it for the social medias or whatever. It was very much a kind of that side of politics is wrong. What you need is to get elected, make passionate speeches and change the world that way. Whereas this film isn't taking a side in the left wing struggle as, as much as that bit of the newsroom was. This film is basically saying, where's Abby Hoffman right? Where's Tom Hayden right? What do they have in common? Where can they work together? That's the approach of this film. Well, yeah, the relationship is left. They have an argument. There is a sort of flashpoint argument between them. And then some more plot happens. They have the sort of meaningful moments. Their eyes meet. They share mutual respect. And that's kind of the end of it. You know, it's if you wanted to criticise Sorkin on this, it's for if anything, he doesn't really have an answer to a lot of his questions other than maybe we all just need to see our common ground and work together, which you could argue is a platitude. But nonetheless, yes, I don't think he's being quite as sneering about this as he has been in the past. Yeah, which is one of the reasons why I enjoyed this film more, that he actually seemed more willing to take on views other than his own. You know, if you, I mean, maybe I mean oversimplifying by just saying Sorkin's view, based on my reading of his past work, is the Tom Hayden view and... I'm sure he has sympathy for Abby Hoffman and his position. But yeah, there is definitely a much more of a sense of trying to find common ground, which is one of the things that I liked to, why and the reasons why I liked him more than the more didactic parts of the newsroom. Yeah, no, I think it feels like a successful Sorkin movie. I think the, a lot of criticisms I've seen of it, are, well, apart from people who are just flat out sick of Aaron Sorkin and after the newsroom, I can't entirely blame them. But anyway, there are from people who are familiar with the history and say that it's not the most accurate historical representation in the world, which is very probably true, although I don't know, I don't tend to come to entertaining historical dramatizations for my accurate history. I'm too cynical for that, really. I just assume that it's largely simplified and made up. I mean, as I've said on this podcast before, well, as I've plugged in this podcast before, if you want a lot of historically accurate information about the period, the 22-hour-long, 10-part Ken Burns Vietnam documentary <laughs> is on Netflix. It's there. It covers the trial of the Chicago 7, as well as everything else about the Vietnam War. It is there. It is available. And I highly recommend it. And since we're going to be locked down for the winter, you've got nothing else to do over Christmas. And also, and the other point I want to make is you know it's a courtroom drama speaking as someone who's been on a jury courtrooms are really boring and i was on the jury for a murder trial and it was really boring so i can see why he's taking liberties to make this entertaining which is i don't think a criticism although i do like historical accuracy in my films are we going to get some of our first ever listener emails now demanding to know which murder you adjudicated contact me on social media and now that it happened over a year ago i will send you news articles about the trial i was in the jury on because i think i'm allowed to do that now because it was tried and sentenced over a year ago but yeah jury duty is boring even for high stakes stuff like murder i mean i gather the actual trial of chicago seven was ridiculous in ways that Sorkin hasn't even put in this film. I think what he's cleverly done, which is one of the things I liked actually most about the film, is that he's zoomed in on the most dramatic parts and the bits that are best for characterization and telling an interesting story. The film covers quite a long period of time and it kind of moves around very fluidly between time periods in the fact you even get what you think at first is one character, you know, responding to another character, and then you find out actually that line of dialogue that you think followed second later was actually weak later because the film has quite nimbly jumped through time which it does very well and it skips over the least dramatic parts of the film most notably for example okay actually before i see this mild spoilers if you've not seen the film or don't know what happens uh yeah skip ahead timestamps. but i do think this is an important point to make because it's about the film is that anyway so you've been warned one thing for example the film skips over is the jury's verdict. He doesn't play that for drama because it's obvious from the start pretty much they're going to be found guilty. Even if you didn't know the history, you can probably tell exactly where this is going. There's no need for him to dramatise that. So he's like, yep, don't need that. We'll just skip from the most dramatic character bit to the sentencing part, which was a dramatic moment at the trial. That's one of the, the things that Sorkins has very confidently done, which is just skip over unnecessary, undramatic parts. Oh well, yeah, there's a sequence just before that where two of the five members of the seven, again, we're in full spoiler territory now. Run if you don't want me to just tell you what happens. It's basically say we're just here to be pardoned so that they'll look reasonable, aren't we? We're the two who they don't want to lock up. And sure enough, when you get to the sentencing part, those two have just vanished. You don't see them get pardoned. You don't see them get up and leave. They're just gone. And you just assume that, yes, what everyone said was going to happen has happened. Yeah, exactly. It's the thing that, like, less experienced, less capable writers, it's mistakes they made. You don't need to show people what they know is happening or have already been told is going to happen or happened unless it's relevant to the story, which in this case it isn't. I'm sure there's a review somewhere in the world, I have not read all of them, which has said that this would have been better if Sorkin had expanded it to a, I don't know, a seven episode 
appropriate enough miniseries, but given his occasional tendency to overwrite and overindulge, I am actually think this may be the best version of itself. I agree with you there, definitely, that his tendency to bloviate is not best served probably by a sound episode miniseries, whereas getting this down to a kind of two-hour film is probably the best version of this. I mean, one thing I would say is that I did feel that, there, I mean, they're all interesting people and characters from history. I did think that Bobby Seale's story could have been better served. I mean, they get some of the most dramatic moments in such as him being denied representation and him being bound and gagged in court, obviously, and being roughed up by the police at various points. But yeah, there is a whole... I mean, you could do a whole film about Bobby Seale. And I did feel that, like, although this this film is about the tension between the various left-wing groups of the time, including the Black Panthers, but it is very much focused on the conflict between the Yippies, Abby Hoffman's group, and the Students for Democratic Society, Tom Hayden's group. And it does get pushed to kind of the second tier of drama, the racial elements, which are important. And you could have done a film about the lives of any of the Chicago Seven, especially any of the core figures, and it would have been fascinating. I think what I would like to have seen is an Aaron Sorkin's written Bobby Seale film, or even better, probably a Spike Lee written and directed Bobby Seale film. I guess Spike Lee's done Malcolm X, so maybe you think it'd be too similar. But uh, yeah, maybe that there's something there that could be a good companion piece to this, uh, if anyone's listening to this podcast for ideas to commission things. But I did feel that we could have got more into Bobby Seale's character, and maybe this would inspire spark some interest in him as a historical figure well yeah it did it did feel a bit like he sort of wandered in from his own story which i guess creates the you know the correct impression but he has a lot of stuff you know going on outside of this film but it did feel like a weird outside thing i mean you know i guess i'm reviewing it like a bit of fiction whereas in reality he did wander in from his own story it's called his actual real life so (laughs) and yeah maybe his depiction here of his involvement in the trial is roughly accurate or maybe it isn't but yes it did feel like he had a lot going on which this film sort of scratched the surface of and he was just sort of you know what happened to him was this unsettling presence in the trial yeah but overall I thought this was handled really well and like Sorkins is like the ideal writer to write this and make it good and I think a lesser writer would have not made this as as entertaining and even though at times like I felt it was really veering into liberal corniness so much praise for rational debate you know over dramatic action but even despite that there are bits when I had a tear in my eye and felt maybe felt that like god maybe maybe biden and and harris will make a better world maybe okay and next up we're going to talk about lovecraft country which i guess is our halloween feature since i think this episode comes out around the sainted day so happy halloween everybody let's talk horror this of course is the new series on hbo written by misha green based on the 2006 novel by Matt Ruff, apparently. And it stars Joni Smollett and Jonathan Majors as two young African Americans who find themselves learning of dark secrets based around their family line, well, around the Jonathan Majors character, Atticus's family line, which pull him into a world of monsters, magic, time travel, and basically all kinds of pulp novel type shit. Yeah, it's a sort of fun horror semi anthology series in which Day and the family around them just get more and more pulled into this weirdness. And yep, we've watched the whole thing, so we may eventually hit some spoilers, but I'm going to try and keep them out for at least a few minutes. Alistair, what did you think? So the first episode of this show is excellent, really, really gripping. And I thought, like, oh, wow, we might be on to another Watchmen here with the first episode. And the last two episodes, I thought, were, were really, really strong. It really kind of pulled all its threads together at the end and had like a tense, spectacular ending. The middle of the series didn't live up to the high points of the first and last episode. I mean, it it wasn't bad. There were some very interesting episodes along the way. We can discuss the details of those. But I felt there was uneven. It was sort of mirandering. The plot kind of went all over the place a bit. But it did pull it back together at the end. So yeah, strong start, strong end, sort of slightly let down in the middle. Actually, it did start strong. Uh, the first two episodes especially are really good. And to be honest, I sort of felt like it kept up with this all the way to the end, really. I didn't entirely feel like it pulled it together that much. I felt like after that, it went into this weird state of every episode had at least one really good sequence. And occasionally, the whole episode was mostly pretty good. For the most part, every episode had long, quite dull stretches, enlivened by the occasional really, really good bit or really, really good subplot. Like... I think, honestly, I just found the the way they were handling the ongoing subplot with the main couple of characters. Tick, played by Jonathan Majors, and Letty, played by Journey Smullett. Just quite 
trudging and tiring. Like, I've, I'm sure I've mentioned, you know, the unfortunate affliction of tedious protagonist syndrome, which afflicts many TV shows, where the main character is just kind of a relatable person, while the supporting cast get to be interesting. And by the time you've watched a few episodes of it, you're just, you just find the main character kind of dull. Like, you know, some have it worse than others. Like, even Buffy the Vampire Slayer herself is not the most interesting character in Buffy by some direction. Some direction, some distance. But yeah, this show seemed to have a really, really debilitating case of that, in that by about halfway to just over halfway through the series, I started really rolling my eyes whenever Atticus turned up to take us away from the sort of story of the week. Because like in the middle episodes, like basically, yeah, as Alastair said, sort of episodes three through eight, the last two and the first two are both devoted to the, the main plot. They have this sort of semi-anthology thing where most of the episode, or at least a fair chunk of it, is devoted to a supporting character or side character going about their business. And Atticus just appears occasionally and to a certain value of occasionally. Like he's in it more sometimes than others. But yeah. I really started to get annoyed when he turned up. It's a shame, because some of those anthology episodes are really good. Like, there's one where Letty's sister discovers a potion that lets her turn into a white person, and, and that's a really, really good episode. Or at least that storyline in that episode is really, really good. Atticus's scenes, as ever, are terrible. And yeah, there's an episode set in Kavir, which covers the period where Atticus was serving in the war there, but he's barely in it. It's mostly about a character, Jai Ah, who is played by Jamie Chung, and about her life and the spirit that inhabits her, and who and what she actually is. And that's a great episode. The fact that Atticus is barely in it may or may not affect my opinion on that, but I thought that was one of the best ones of the series. Certainly the best ones outside the first couple. And yeah, a lot of my opinions are very similar to that. There's an episode which has a lengthy time travel sequence featuring Atticus's aunt. I think it's his aunt. That's an amazing sequence. Everything else in the episode? Yeah, no. Possibly because I'd grown so weary of Atticus. By the time Atticus took the show back over properly in the last couple of episodes, I wasn't really that bothered. Although I will admit, the actual last half of the last episode, where things finally happen and the plot is finally resolved, that was quite good and exciting. So yeah, intermittent TV this. It's okay. A decent amount of good bits, but it's hard for me to be that emphatic about it because some of the long, boring sections are quite long and boring. Yeah, I suppose while we left out of our introduction, I, I assume probably most people have heard of the show or have watched it, is that it's set in the mid-1950s, which is, yeah, integral to it, and it brings in a lot of the, again, similar to Trial of the Chicago 7, brings in a lot of the politics, especially the racial politics of the era. All of the cast are black, and as well as the supernatural uh, Lovecraft-esque plot, they're dealing with the racism of the period, which is one of the reasons why, yeah, I completely agree with you. I really liked the episode where Ruby finds a potion to turn her white and she gets her dream job of working in this very fancy department store, which she's really struggled and been unable to get, you know, even the kind of lowest position in there. And when she's white and she applies, discovers she's overqualified and instantly gets like a manager job, yeah, which obviously comes as a surprise to her. Yeah, that's a really good episode. I liked the Korean War episode set a few years before, you know, the events of this show as this is the mid-1950s. That episode's great. You know, each episode has a kind of interesting thing or so in it a lot of it takes place around this house that the letty character has bought probably one of the most self-contained most just kind of anthology of the episodes is the one when she buys the house and finds out it's haunted it's all you know it works as a premiere of a kind of just a straight up haunted house story you know even though the haunting it weaves in some elements of the racial politics in that it's haunted because there was a white person who lived there who liked to torture and murder black people which is bringing the two things the show marries which is the racial politics of the 1950s and the lovecraft-esque cultness brings them together but it's not particularly related to the rest of the show it's just a self-contained haunted house story but this kind of episodic nature sort of meandering nature meant that it was very often like where's this going it was kind of hard to find out where where it's going what how this related to the overall plot a lot of the time it maybe didn't or it would just in some very tangential way connect up although there are many good episodes of interesting things going on um they often didn't seem to relate back to the main plot that is true but i preferred them all to the main plot so it's hard for me to really complain i guess there's two different sides of the same coin i think the fact when we got to the third episode and it diverged into this sort of slightly more i don't know ghost monster weird thing of the week structure for a bit yeah it was a change to what i was expecting from the show because i'd assumed that the whole show was going to be like the first two episodes where it was like this road trip type setup but no it turns out that really was just the first two episodes and then they were going to go home and it was going to be like a ghost of the week in their local area yeah which is which was a surprise and, you know, once you accept that the show is that, yeah, that's what they did. It was fine. I mean, they had a... I quite liked it in a way, because I was expecting them to focus on this sort of big monster Lovecraft horror thing through the entire show. So part of me was pleasantly surprised to discover they actually had this sort of wider variety of sci-fi fantasy influences. Like, there's, I think it's episode four, where they end up sort of exploring a temple in this sort of pulp Indiana Jones way. Once that sequence got going, the first half of that episode, dull as shit. Last half of that episode, once they started exploring the temple, really good fun. Yeah, they do bring in a lot of, like, pulp things. I mean, the, the show... 
it opens with this amazing sequence of throws in like hundreds of sort of like 1930s and 1940s pulp influences kind of everything from like ufos to cthulhu was kind of thrown into this bizarre like opening sequence so it does it really does riff on its cult things and it there's not too much stuff that's like explicitly lovecraft some of the plot especially the road trip episode does take place in arnhem a sort of fictional town where a lot of the lovecraft stories take place around it does you mention that and it does and bits of it are set in kind of new england but although there's lots of lovecraft-esque things going on there's cults magic there's a book of spells and sort of like forbidden knowledge there's lots of tentacled creatures you know fishy watery kind of sea monstery things the big lovecraft stuff doesn't explicitly appear like cthulhu doesn't appear outside the opening bit the necronomicon is not mentioned although they have their slightly different version the book of names it's very much in the brings in the feel of lovecraft and it's certainly got the tone and feel of lovecraft right without directly bringing in a lot of lovecraft stuff and also the other thing they brought in is lovecraft was incredibly racist and uh this show is about the incredible racism of the period well yeah a lot of the racism about every stuff is some of the clever stuff that works like i i must admit part of me would rather have had more stuff like the episode with ruby living as a white person or the episode with hippolyta traveling back in time and exploring these different eras of, of black womanhood throughout the past and yeah a bit less of Titus pontificating over books. The frustrating thing about this show is that every episode usually contains at least one good sequence or idea. It's definitely, uh, you know, some interesting cleverness put into it. Like, I think Jordan Peele, the writer-director of Get Out, is involved in this in some way. It does have a vague reminiscence of that. There's a, Yeah, there's an episode when Diana, the younger character, is being pursued by a sort of evil spirit version of herself that really reminded me of us. Yes, actually. Yeah, actually, you're right. I do remember having a flicker of recognition when I saw that, and you're right, it's us. Yeah, there's a possibility that they are both texts are referencing one particular thing, or it's just a it's a cool conceit. That bit was actually quite scary. The the demonic version of Diana that followed her everywhere. Well, yeah, and the fact, that, and obviously she was cursed by a cop, wasn't she? That was the the plot of that episode. So yeah, that bit, a lot of layers going on in that one. That was another good subplot. Yeah, cursed by a racist police. This show has certainly struck a chord, and it, it's risen to this point of popularity where it's it's deemed worthy of a Guardian recap blog this point that i'm just going to steal straight from said blog so this is not my opinion but and it's opinion i've seen echoed is for a show that's about occultists monsters human sacrifice you know unspeakable creatures from the depth of from space and all the other lovecraft stuff it's a show where the racist cops are the scariest thing in it obviously some of those racist cops are also occultists with unearthly powers you know at the same time especially in the first episodes a racist cop in a sundown country where he could just kill the main characters and no one would ever ask a question is a much scarier more intense sequence or antagonist than the shapeless nameless monster that comes out of the darkness to bite people's heads off yeah i mean i think in the first episode especially yeah as you say they have this showdown with the cops and then you're almost relieved or it almost seems you know easier and more fun and simplistic when you know a massive lovecraftian monster comes along to eat people it always seems like a release of tension from when they're just having a standoff with the police i mean i did like how it brings in the the racism and the politics as well as we together with the fantasy and you know it works and yeah it, it seems very of the period and also like i say it's, it's probably one of the most true to lovecraft adaptations uh, i've ever seen of something by or inspired by him because it, it does manage to reflect his horrendous racism and also like explore it by weaving in actual events from history like the second last episode when they tie and travel back to the tulsa riots which obviously yeah, also appeared in Watchmen last year an important part of American history that's getting more exposure like that was yeah a powerful way to bring in a really sad part of history into this fantasy story and like we, again the show was very deftly weaving together black history with a, a fantastical occult story yeah so I liked the end of the time travel episode where yeah they went back in time and it gave them a chance to both dramatise that event and dramatise a lot of the conflicts with the characters it, yeah one of the things this show does well is as you say sort of combining talking about these issues with talking about how they actually affect the characters so it doesn't come across as preaching which is usually quite nicely balanced yeah and yeah the cast are all really good it's a very strong lineup of actors yeah i especially enjoyed journey smilet as the main female character letty and michael k williams omar from the wire as the main character's dad montrose i thought was really good in his at times slightly small secretive part i thought he played it really well yeah i thought that yeah michael kenneth williams was excellent it's just in us a man haunted by so many demons from what he saw in tulsa and also just being older is 
you know, experienced probably yeah, even more racism than his son Atticus. And I just thought the character was played so well. And there's so many things I've read about that kind of really resonated that character. I recently read Tani Nahasi Coates's Between the World and Me. That has a lot about his relationship with his father. And you can kind of see a similar sort of dynamic playing out there. So I really felt that was a yeah, great performance. Yeah, as I say, I grew a little weary of the main character, Tick. So I don't, I don't quite know if that was Jonathan Majors' fault or the writing's fault. But yeah, I thought a lot of the other cast did great jobs. So especially, as I say, I thought Ruby's part was one of the best characters in it. And I thought Wumi Masaku, who played her, was really great. Mm, absolutely, yeah. She was yeah, she was excellent. I think Jonathan Majors does hero, sort of slightly bland hero, very well. And he, especially in the Korean War episode, I felt he showed his range a bit more then i think it's just that possibly exactly as you say atticus is kind of let down by being slightly brand hero which is is a less interesting character than you know father haunted by demons or ruby's desperate desire to have the one thing that she can't have and willingness to do anything to get it are just more interesting characters it's, that's not really a jonathan majors does what he can with the part yeah but he was in the five bloods which we also watched as one of the main characters sons and yeah yeah he was good there yeah, so I would recommend this to people. It's all on Now TV. I think it goes away relatively soon, so you might want to get on that. A couple of weeks. So I would I would recommend it. When I first watched it, I thought, could this be 2020's Watchmen? It isn't, but that doesn't mean it's not good and it's not worth watching. As you might have guessed, a slightly less emphatic recommendation from me. I thought it was all right. I can't say I'm sure I'd watch a second season, but it's fine. And if you're willing to sit through the dull parts for the good parts, then the good parts are very good when they come. <laughs> That's all we have time for today. If you have enjoyed this episode of Moderate Fantasy Violence, then please rate and review us in your podcatcher of choice, as it helps other people find out about the show. You can also visit our website, moderatefantasyviolence.com, where you can listen to other episodes of this podcast and read bonus written pieces by Nick and myself. And if you particularly enjoyed the podcast and you want to hear every single thing we could possibly think of to say, you could also follow us on social media at MFE Podcast or go onto our Facebook, which is which you can find by searching for Moderate Fantasy Violence. And yep, yeah, I've been Nick Bryan. You can find me online at my Twitter, which is at NickMB, or on my website, which is NickBryan.com. I've been Alistair Ball. You can find more from me on Twitter, where I'm at Alistair J.R. Ball, and you can find more of my writing at RedTrainBlog.com. Join us next time where we will be reviewing the first four episodes of the third series of Star Trek Discovery, and we'll be returning to Amazon Prime's The Boys to find out what we thought of the rest of the second series. So join us in two weeks' time for both of those. Until then, have a good one. Goodbye. Happy Halloween. Yeah, a lot of the, the racism allegory stuff is quite fun, especially when they... Well, fun is definitely the wrong word. Hang on, I'm going to rephrase that.